three distinguished uh, leaders working as CEO now or in the past and doing very, very unusual things that they're making the world a better place. I know that from the conversation I had with them. So we will start with Andre, who is working in uh, utilities in Geneva and is on the cutting edge. Do you want to start? So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to contribute to this Friday morning session about servant leadership in this century and in the next one. I will tell you a small story about a necessary paradigm change and try to demonstrate that it can be done today. This paradigm change is quite simple to understand, a little more complex to realize. It has to do with sustainability, especially with, with our way to manage energy. So once upon a time, at the beginning of last century, there was a train rolling across America and pulled by a fantastic locomotive called Pacific 231. <laughs> At the same time, in another country, in Switzerland to be precise, a music composer said, I have always loved locomotives, with passionately. For me, they are living creatures. His name was Arthur Honecker. You'll find him on the 20 franc, uh, franc Swiss bank note here. He was so enthusiastic about steam locomotives that he composed a music piece called Pacific 231, describing the journey of the locomotive you just see. Now, why 231? Look at the number of axles of that locomotive. Two pilot axles, three driving in the middle, and one at the rear, 231. A historical orchestral work was born. You can see here an extract of the first page of that work. And as you see, the sentence he pronounced at the bottom of the page, Arthur Honecker was more than a music composer. He was a leader. And the last actor of my story is the world of energy, its production and its consumption, symbolized by the powerful train. So the three heroes are now in place, a locomotive, Pacific 231, a leader in music, Arthur Honecker, and a very sensible country, Energyland. The story can begin. At the beginning of the story, more than 200 years ago, Pacific 231 was only moved by one kind of energy, coal, a wood. The need for energy was small, and a certain balance between production, natural production and consumption was possible. With the time to try to respond to a growing demand for energy, wood was replaced by coal, followed then by petrol and by gas. These energies were available in great quantities. There were no limits to consume them. Economical growth justified the destruction within one century of fossil reserves that our nature produced millennia to uh, produce. Besides that, the use of fossil sources increased massively our CO2 emissions with unknown consequences on our world climate. Interesting in terms of music, this part of the story has been illustrated by another music composer of the 20th century, Paul Ducasse and his sorcerer's apprentice. With the time, starting 1917, with the Meadows Report due to the initiative of the Club of Rome and of the MIT, a growing proportion of leaders asked the sustainability of the fossil-based energy approach. A new kind of energy was developed, hydraulic. <coughs> Zermatt is the best example you can find in Switzerland, as almost all the water of the valley, it means 140 billions of liters per year, is pumped to an altitude of 2,400 meters in drift and then flows in a 30 kilometer tunnel through the Alps to the Lac des Dix created by the largest dam in Europe, the Grand Dixence. 
A little bit later, Pacific 231 discovered the nuclear energy for war and for peace. And at the end of last century, the first attempts to find a renewable way to produce energy started. Sun, wind, waste, geothermal energy, biomass were born. But some of these new ways to bring Pacific 231 forward were generating new problems. But the world was growing and evolving. Population, economic activities, quality of life, new big players like India, China or Brazil. The needs for energy were growing and growing. So today the story is the following. Pacific 231 tries to reduce the consumption of fossil sources to avoid scarcity and CO2 emissions. Hydraulic energy has been developed all over the world. The nuclear energy has slowed down due to the radioactive waste problem and severe accidents. The proportion of renewable energies is growing, but fighting against strong established economic interests. And this is new. A new behavior and new technologies appear and could contribute to better balance, energy efficiency. Humanity should learn to consume less energy and especially to consume it in an efficient way. But the situation is not at all under control. The way Pacific 231 is going forward is not sustainable. How, do we can, how can we find a better balance? So, ladies and gentlemen, what we need is not more technology. It's not more administration or more scientific theories. What we need is the courage to take only two decisions at highest possible level. The first one, forget nuclear energy as soon as possible. The second one, forget, forget fossil energy sources in the middle run. What Pacific 231 needs is the courage to take the two decisions today and to transform them in a reality during the next 20 to 30 years. This will create the necessary political, economical, ethical environment to develop the new renewable energy and to reach sustainability. Ladies and gentlemen, this is servant leadership. This is a paradigm change. This is high performance leadership in a changing world. <laughs> The result of these two decisions would be reality in 2050. Pacific 231 would move with hydraulic, with sun, with wind, in a very efficient way. All the energy it needs would be produced by renewable energy. Let's remember, this is very important, the total energy sent by the sun to our earth within six hours is the equivalent of the consumption of electricity of the whole humanity within one year. Pacific 231 would go forward in a sustainable way. He would be ready for the long term. Now, Pacific 231 has reached the sustainable energy land. It's moving fast, but it respects political, economical, social and environmental constraints and laws. It runs a steady state like the music of Arthur Honecker. It's entering the first station of the sustainable energy land. Leadership is the courage of taking the right decision at the right time, even when people believe the solution to be impossible. Now and today, let's demonstrate global leadership based on sustainable Good morning. I'd like to start with one question. How many in the rooms here 
are actual CEOs. I mean by that people who have the ultimate responsibility of their company reporting to a board of directors. Would you raise your hands? Why am I asking these questions? Well, we're talking about globalization, humanizing globalization, and basically we're talking about the economy because today uh, everything we, we're looking at and the effect of globalization is linked to the economy. The economy is made by the millions of companies worldwide, there's a night, small or, or big, that are making that economy. And I take the point that the way they behave, their attitude in this economy is shaping the globalization. The point is that as CEO of a company, we have a paramount uh, influence on the attitude and behaviors of the people that are composing the, co the company. Which means that I would make the point that globalization is about, by far, about the attitude and culture of those millions of CEOs that days and night, every day, are taking decisions worldwide. So if we want human, uh, globalization to become more human, it has to go through those people. Not only, obviously, but they have a paramount effect. We've talked yesterday about regulation, laws, and so on. If the guy who is in charge of the company want this company to be just profit-minded, if you want this company not to be ethics, he will find ways around any regulation, any laws to do it. If he wants to do it, he doesn't need any regulation, any laws, he will do it and you will be successful at doing it. So that's what we call leadership. Now, the seventh leadership, I think uh, it was mentioned yesterday by uh, at the introduction uh, about the divided life syndrome. It means if we are Christian, and I'm the president of a, a um, worldwide Christian executive association, so it's something we, we talked about it, but even for non-Christian, the syndrome of divided life. I'm the good guy when I'm at home during the weekend, but when I'm in my office, I just have to run the company. That somebody yesterday mentioned this phrase from sorrow, which horrified me. When I'm in a market, I behave like the market. When I'm not, doing, when market is closed, I start thinking about the others. And I think that's wrong. If we have a divided life, we will never be able to run our companies and to have an influence on the economy in the sense of what we want is to make our economy more human. For Christian, they will try to find, to fight the syndrome of divided life we all have through spirituality. For non-Christian, through family life, through engagement, through whatever, that allows them permanently to find that we have only one life, at job and out of job. Now, the leader, obviously, will define the vision he has from his company. We talked yesterday about just profit-minded company or company that would consider they have a responsibility towards the society in which they are operating. Again, uh, if you have this syndrome of divided life, that is not a question. During my time as a CEO, I would just run my company to make the maximum profit, maintain my position and get the highest salary as possible. And then during the out of office time, if I have some, I'd be the nice guy. So it's again very much linked. Well, I would just focus on the seven aspect, which is coming from the management style. Uh, somebody yesterday say, if somebody, if we could, could, excuse me, all smile once in the day, that would change many things. It sounds like a small impact, but those small impacts have a huge consequence. In and I think the management job, just the attitude of the CEO, particularly and of his top management group is key in the attitude of the people within the company and as such on the attitude of um, the, the, his company towards the economy and the society at large. Subsidiarity. This is a world which is not always well known. It was introduced by the Christian, by the Catholic Church about one century ago. Uh, and, and I really believe this could change the world significantly. It, because it was devised initially to set the rules within public organization, the, the higher level having to leave the lower level doing the maximum it can do, but in fact it applies perfectly to management. Subsidiarity means that you have to act as a leader to define precisely the realm of responsibility of the lower level, his degree of autonomy, where his decision will have no impact outside of his realm of responsibility. The second aspect of leadership 
is to choose the right people, to train them, and to give them the right tools. That's relatively well known in company. What is a little bit more difficult is that within subsidiarity as opposition to delegation, there is a third point, which is very key. When you have done that as a leader, you have to accept to take the risk of the freedom of the decision of the lower level. In, in delegation, you give your power, but at any time you can take it back. In subsidiarity, you give the power and you assume the decision of those to whom you have given that power. And I sometimes use this example that I draw from a movie. I'm a sailor and I like that movie very much uh, from a standoffer, which is called the Crap Tambour. It's about a Navy, French Navy ship in the North Atlantic in the middle of a storm. And that ship is going to go into the harbor. On the deck, you have the captain, you have the pilot. The pilot is doing his job. And at one point, the head of the mechanic says to a young guy that you will see, the captain will say, je prends, I take over. He will give free orders and the boat will be uh, on the wharf with no damage. That's delegation. It's very comfortable for the pilot. He knows the boss is on his back and he will always be there if something goes wrong. It creates a lot of visibility to the boss. He's on the deck, everybody knows, he knows everything. And he will demonstrate permanently how much he knows about what he's supposed to do. That's delegation. In subsidiarity in the same movie, the captain will be in his cabin reading or sleeping because he knows he's chosen the right guy. He knows he can trust him. And he takes the risk of the decision of the pilot because he knows in the French Navy, like in any Navy, that if the boat hit the wharf, he's going to be fired, not the pilot. That's the difference between subsidiarity and delegation. Now, think about it. If in all our company, but not just companies, we could just play that role and permanently take the risk of the decision of our lower level of our collaborators, the world would already change tremendously. Now, again, it doesn't mean forgiving about forgetting about the responsibility we have. Again, we have to define a realm of responsibility. We have to choose the people. We have to give them where they want to go. Uh, and that's the essence of being a leader. But when you take the risk of the lower level, then you become servant. Exactly as Christian, as Christ, uh, washing the feet of his disciples. He was God. He knew he was God. He let those disciples go. Or God during the Old Testament. He picked up his people, trained his people permanently, and he had to do it several times, but basically let them the freedom. God at the feet of the freedom of his disciples. To a large extent, as CEO, we should be at the feet of our collaborators, at the feet of their decision. It doesn't mean forgetting about our responsibility, but it, it means being really servant of their own freedom. And that's where you introduce that gratuity in the economy, as the Pope recently remember all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I have a slide. So I basically would like to make uh, nine points. So I will go, th go through the slides. First of all, I would like to say that I am, like each of you, very concerned by the damage of the financial crisis, both real damage, but also damage in the mind of people. But the answer to me is not to invent revolutionary things. We just need to go back to very basic things about free market system and origin of company. So before talking about CEO responsibility, let me mention basic things about free markets. And basically, this is the idea of servant companies. A market economy is a huge progress of mankind, going from aggressiveness and constant fighting to commerce and exchange. Market economy basically transforms potential enemies into customers and partners. Formal corporations were born when people discovered balance sheets, so 500 years ago. Market economy is freedom, freedom to exchange. Com corporations are vehicle of initiative, therefore of people development. Unfortunately, after 500 years, a lot of people still ask questions. Controlled economy are gone, but their inspires, and I call them Marxism, is still alive in the mind, especially in Europe and France. Marxists view production as a center of value creation. This is the wrong idea. This is the idea of capitalists with money, buying machines, exploiting workers, manipulating consumer with uh, advertising, and then make profit. 
This idea is still there. This idea is perpetuated by people who have no practical business experience and basically we take customers, so each of us like crazy people. One of the reasons of this misunderstanding, in my opinion, is that unfortunately, business people don't spend enough time talking about the beauty of free market systems. We have to explain that the essence of the economy is not production, but exchange. Company only exist when they provide a service. There is a lot of competition, so customers can switch from company to the other. So if a company exists, it's, it gives a, give a, a, a free service. We must explain that a company is a servant. So let me move to the second point. Servant company can be successfully managed by tyrannic bosses. The good company is the one who listens to customers and serve him best. Winning companies are service-minded companies. Do you really think that a company with success depends on service to customer can be managed efficiently by bosses obsessed by power. Successful company can be only managed by service-minded bosses. Power-minded bosses do certainly exist, but they manage companies that will soon disappear and be bought by service-minded company managed by servant leaders. Let me move to the third point, servant leader and personality development. Buying and selling a product requires personal decision from the seller and from the buyer. For the buyer, I put my money in the, into this product, in this service, will be okay for me, the decision. For the seller, I am confident that the check I get will be paid. This is also a decision. So for the two actors, exchange requires personal judgment, therefore develops responsibility. Successful exchange stimulates specialization. Because if I buy a product that I don't produce myself, I basically accept to depend on somebody else. So sooner or later, I will focus on what I do my best. So relying on exchange means specialization in the long term. If we look ahead, free market system should become a world of champions, world champion, where everybody depends on the others. Free market is fundamentally a world of excellence and interrelationship. That's why state activity has to be kept to activity that only state can do. Justice, police, foreign affairs and army. The reason is simple. When state develops its activity, product or services are imposed. Competition disappears, price is zero. Everything is paid in bulk by taxes. So you cannot choose products except by voting every five years. So if state develops too much, ability of each of us to, to make choices goes down. So it put, puts our personality down. So servant CEO, by promoting free market, are personality developers. Let me talk now about common interest. CEO, competition, and common interest. When exchange is repeated over time, both partners, find their own interest in this lasting relationship. In such a case, the personal interest of the two partners merges into general interest and common goods. It is very unfair to claim that only public sector contributes to general interest. Private sector contributes to public interest when the free relationship lasts over time. Of course, public sector constantly claims it works for general interest. It is totally true when state practice justice, police, diplomacy, army, and local management. Without a strong state, freedom and property rights wouldn't exist. In such an environment, a company cannot simply perform. Every one of us knows that it is impossible to do business when there is no freedom. But this is then true when state management, that state managed service that free market could also perform. Because when the state operas, operates, it requires to be given mon mon monopoly. Then competition disappears. Mankind being what it is, power of employees grows, and it's very difficult to manage that. At least in France, most of the strikes occur in public sector. Absent aims in public sector is many times what is in private sector. So the cost of performing those functions explodes. 
This can put the whole society in danger in worldwide environment. It cannot be described as, prom as promoting general interest. Of course, the company serves, among other things, the private interest of stockholders. But competition is there. Competition naturally controls price and profit. By controlling price and profit, competition enables self-interest to converge to general interest, where monopoly distracts public service from general interest. So servant CEO responsibility is to make sure that his own company creates long-term relationship. The servant CEO responsibility is then sure to make sure that this company performs better than competition is the best way to be sure that the company works for general interest. Talk about divers diversity. Servant CEO promotes diversity by growing international. All businesses are not international. In fact, the majority of business is local. But the scope of each business stands to expand dramatically nowadays. Exchange comes from difference between people. If we were all alike, we wouldn't exchange. We would even talk. So exchange comes from diversity. Diversity is the basic source of business. By far, the easiest way to, to, to find diversity today is going abroad. So the best service CEO or the servant CEO, the best he can do for the company is to get as international as the company can support. This is the way to get new experience, to get new progress. The best service that the company can offer to the company is to open systematically to outside world. Going international has another virtue. It gives growth. And growth is like oil in the organization. Growth is moving tension. Growth opens the field of everybody. So servant CEO should grow their company internationally. Talk now about profit. Servant CEO and profit. Employee ownership. Profit is by no means the measure of exploitation, exploitation or manipulation, as Marxists still explain. Manipulation can work in short term or little percentage. Exploitation and manipulation doesn't exist, doesn't explain how to grow a company and times over time. In all fairness, profit is a reward. Profit is a reward that customers give to the best supplier. Profit is the proof that the product met customer expectation. In a competitive environment, profit is a proof that operations are correctly organized. When the quality of product is competitive, the company will expand internationally. The world is the sole limit. Companies who have been able to grow 100 times don't exploit employees 100 times. They expand because they sell the good product that everybody buys. Profit is a sign that the company has correctly invested. Profit is also by far the simple way to finance a company. Profit is a control system because it attracts competition. Profit works as a natural regulator. It's a pity that so few people understand the wide variety of services provided by profit. So a servant CEO has to teach his employees the sense of profit. The best way to teach employees the essence of profit is by far to help them acquire capital of the company. Permitting an employee to own part of the company as a capital is a way to change the company spirit, is a way to teach risk-taking risk to employees. Don't forget risk-taking is the justification of profit. Employee shareholding is a true answer to the financial crisis. Now move to competition. CEO freedom, competition, and experience. People have an ambiguous attitude toward competition. They like competition when they buy a product, but they want monopoly when they produce. The issue that each of us is both producer and consumer, so competition cannot be split. Of course, competition creates some stress. I call it good stress. But a servant manager has to show his team how to manage stress and transform it into perfect personal leverage. In controlled economy, competition disappears, but you have the stress of political police. I prefer the, the stress of competition to the kind of stress in the disappeared controlled economies. Competition stimulates. A champion needs competition to excel. 
Champion is a result of competition. Each of us can be a champion. Competition, like freedom, is a chance in make sure to ensure equality of chance. Competition is another name we should give to freedom. So Servant CEO should teach his colleague to use competition as a way to make progress. Servant CEO in finance. Financial leverage permits theory theoretically to, to make in five, year, in, five, in five years what normally should take 15 years. What is hidden, of course, is the increased risk created by leverage. Recent crisis revealed that this risk exists and cannot be diversified. So before over leveraging a company, uh, the CEO has to think twice. You cannot buy time. As far as I am concerned, I always recommended to manage a silo without debt. We have been able to grow constantly without debt. We enormously benefited from zero debt strategy during the crisis. Too high reliance on debt is not sustainable development. This is true to company as well as for space. In recent times, leverage is associated with LBOs. LBOs basically put a debt on a company to shift its ownership. We tend to use the more leveraging, we should use the word loading. When a company was poorly managed and underpriced, LBO can work. With efficient market, LBO cannot work because they put unsustainable, unsustainable debt on the companies. Miscalculated LBO kill company by overloading. They are crimes against company, so servant CEO should refuse them. Now my last point is mystery. Servant and su successful CEO remains a mystery. CEO job is to help employees to work happily and perform in a free and highly competitive environment. The best way to keep a good the best way to do it is to keep a good atmosphere where people work in confidence. This is a full-time job and this full-time job should last at least 15 years. Confidence, but what is confidence? Confidence is a mixture of confidence in oneself, confidence in the colleagues, and confidence in the strategy of the company. You get to keep the three at the same time. This is the difficulty. In particular, without a good strategy, you cannot create and keep confidence within a company. CEO responsibility go, goes even further. Create and keep this atmosphere of confidence within the company, but also with outside stakeholders, I mean shareholders and suppliers. Normal business, every business, becomes then sustainable business. Generally speaking, I do think that every single business, honestly and efficiently managed, can claim to be social and sustainable development. A critical dimension of confidence is fair reward to employees in, ca in case of success and be more important, helping people learning from mistakes. One may learn much more from a mistake than from a success. When a team knows that if he acts in such an environment, uh, people are not afraid to take responsibility. They move ahead. When this spirit is, a, is alive in a company, any company can become world leader. So there is absolutely no opposition to me between good atmosphere and efficiency. I even think that good atmosphere is the best way to be efficient. So servant leader are the most efficient in the long term. Confidence, which is the responsibility of CEO, remains a mystery. Most of the time it's hidden because media focus on bad things rather on good things, but it happens much more frequently, you believe. Thank you to have given me this opportunity to express myself. Thank you very much. Let everybody stand up. You've been sitting for over an hour. It's early in the morning. Get the neurons firing and find someone near you that you haven't met yet, if possible, say hello, and what, li listen, listen up, what is one idea that you got from the panel this morning, Shh. and what is one question you have, all right?
What is one idea, important idea, and one question? It's very kind, but I have to jump around just to make sure everything is working. Thank you. You have to come to a different conference where I'm speaking. Okay. Not moderating. <laughs> I will do it. Good. Tobias, we didn't get a chance to talk yesterday properly. Let me put this off, otherwise it will be broadcast. Okay, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. partner a very big thank you and have a seat. So we're going to just open the floor up to the questions. You can, who, who all has a question? Okay. That's all? There should be a lot more questions. Okay. So when you ask your question, if you want to ask, ask it directly to one of the panelists, say who that is. Otherwise, I'm going to distribute it. Please make the question very direct and very brief. And if you want, throw in the idea that you got. Coming together here at the Zelmet Summit is an opportunity to collect ideas. But you have to pay attention when you have an idea. Otherwise, what happens? It's gone. Think of all the great, great ideas you've lost. Okay, so you have a question right here. We'll start here. Uh, this question is for you, George. Okay. You don't mind me calling you George. That's perfect. Because your surname, I'm not sure I can pronounce it. Uh, uh, George is fine. Okay, thank you, George. Um, I've got a major concern after having heard uh, the different... Um, um, interventions over the, the past uh, day and today. Very interesting, of course. Um, I think the notion of servant is contained in the notion of leadership, as well as the, the concept of sustainability. Um, but one thing which puzzles me right now, um, because I'm working on a case study, uh, is the question of the freedom of choice. The freedom of choosing the right um, goal for the leader servant. And the complexity I see in real leaders I know who incarn all these values, who are faced to an environment which is not very human. I'll give you an example. You know briefly. the group briefly Energizer, the batteries. Um, it's closing down. It's a very profitable enterprise. High standards of quality security. And I'm working with the people to try and help them find new jobs. The CEO is a human leader, a servant leader. But he belongs to a group, an American group. And the American group, the headquarters, have chosen to shut the firm, close down the firm, firm which is profitable. How can we help these leaders survive in an environment 
such as that one? Um, that's a complex answer or question. And really it involves the mindset of the leader. Leaders have to deal with complexity. And they have to deal with the reality that a very important thing happened. Family businesses were where business was run 100 years ago. Huh? And at some point, there was a decision made to give corporations the opportunity to act as a person. They have the rights of a person. And legally, they're treated like a person. This, I think, was a very, very big transition and took us away from human governance. How do we come back to human governance? How do we teach ethics? Human governance means I come back to my basic humanness, I treat the organization as a human, and let's face it, a corporation is not a human being. It's not a human being. And we try to treat it legally as a human being, and this creates a lot of problems. I feel a lot of compassion, a lot of grief for this kind of situation. The best that the CEO can do is fight for what he believes in, stands up for what he believes in, and get to those people who make those decisions. Are these decisions based purely on profit or are there other reasons? Yeah. So way in the back there was a hand. Oh, yep. Yeah. Who calls the factory in your opinion? It's not the chairman, it's the customer. Yourself probably closed the factory by not buying an electrical car. So as long as you don't understand that the chairman is not closing the factory, who is closing the factory is the customer, you have a lot of difficulty to understand today's market. I know it's not easy, but basically the customer didn't choose the product and the customer closed the factory, not the chairman. The chairman had to close the factory to uh, defend the company. But it's basically the customer. So as long as you don't understand this mystery, that in fact, as customer, we close the factory. You have probably, uh, you know, your t-shirt is made in, in Thailand, probably. You close a European uh, factory by buying a Thailand t-shirt. So as long as you don't understand that, uh, you know, it's very difficult. And of course, the market system has to help with a good employment system where when the customer doesn't want a product, so of course we have to find a good uh, market system where people can find another job. Okay, thank you. That's as, the answer. As CEOs or as uh, knowing how this works, what does a CEO do in this kind of situation? Uh, it's always difficult to, to, to draw a generalization from a particular case that you don't know the details. I have shut down factories and subsidiaries for the last 30 years, and I have opened probably even more. Uh, when a CEO takes a decision to shut down a company, it's not just for the fun. It's exactly as Xavier was saying. It's because we consider at one point that the economic context of this given operation is not anymore sustainable for the given operation. And exactly as Xavier is saying, it's a consequence of its position on the market. Now, if a decision as a CEO of a subsidiary from a larger company, if really the, this local CEO is convinced that his operation uh, can be sustainable, then he has exactly as you say, to stand up and to demonstrate that it can be sustainable. Okay. We're in the back. Hello, Lucas Chambers. Um, I have a question for Mr. Fontanet. Uh, Mr. Fontanet, at one point you uh, compared uh, productivity really between private and public companies. You were saying in France absenteeism is way higher in public companies, um, less motivating, less competition. Um, I agree with that to a certain extent. I, I've seen it before, but having been in both the private and public sector, I've noticed that one of the problems is that in the private sector where there is productivity, people are also under a lot of stress, often threatened you know, with being fired if they aren't productive enough Whereas in the public sector, that tends to be perhaps less of a threat. Now, I was just, I just thought that you pointed out the, the disadvantage of the public sector and the lack of motivation there, but what about the other side then? What about the danger of that stress, of that uh, unhappy situation that can occur in the private sector where you're under a lot more pressure? Okay. The question of stress, you know, have you been working in a controlled economy yourself 
have you been working in Russia? Or I have been working in Russia and uh, East uh, Germany before the wall. I can tell you, of course, there is less stress on work, but you have a lot of political stress. Uh, and you know, when you are in a free market economy, of course, you have the, the stress that the customer can change and can buy another product. But I really prefer the stress of you know, competition instead of stress of the control economy. If you want freedom, you have to pay for a little stress. Now, what I said that if the strategy, the big difficulty of uh, confidence is that the strategy has to be good. You cannot think on confidence within a company. You have also to take, to, to take, uh, to take uh, understand what is uh, outside. You have to understand outside pressure. And of course, without a good strategy, uh, people will be in difficult position. So the question is that everybody, every company should get good strategy. And, and there are a lot of, things, lot of things there to improve the world. So you're always balancing the individual Inside with the greater good. and outside. Good. But I say, of course, stress is important. But freedom, freedom has a huge value. And we have to pay for freedom. OK, very good. All right, this gentleman. Uh, my question addresses to Pierre Lecoq. Uh, you mentioned two key elements of the common good. Uh, subsidiarity and gratuity. It seems to me that there are two words a little bit forgotten and erased from public sector. But my question is, how do you place uh, gratuity in this process of humanizing economy, humanizing uh, business relationship? And most of all, how do you place gratuity in the role of a local or a global leader? But put, 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 you, put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> that's, that's a tough one. Uh, it depends on how you define gratuity. For me, gratuity is more a state of mind, a personal attitude. And when we talked about gratuity in As a Seven Leadership, uh, the image I used of Christ uh, kneeling at the feet of his disciples and washing their feet, knowing he was fully God and still kneeling in front of the freedom of his disciple, this is the best example of gratuity. And I think as, as, a, as a CEO, as a leader, when you deploy fully uh, the concept called uh, subsidiarity, where really you let, you put your people, your, your employees in a situation when they can exercise their freedom, it's a fantastic gift. It's a gift that based their dignity as men. And I think that's probably where we have to find gratuity. And when Benedictus XVII talked about gratuity in the economy, he was not so much talking about offering free product that has nothing to do with what we're doing. He was much more talking about the attitude we should have to offer our knowledge, our experience, our intelligence as gift to an organization and to the dignity of those who are working within that organization. Thank you. Yeah, good morning to the free speakers, if I may. <laughs> if we look at the growth process, we have really new actors coming in for the last years, very strongly, very faster. So let's take China, India, probably Turkey, Brazil, and some others. How do you judge them in terms of their attitudes, their changes, and their challenges to one thing only, humanizing globalization? Do these actors bring more opportunities and how for a humanized economic system or not? It's a <clears throat> very good news. It's a very good news that new countries are entering into the world and China and India are giants. So probably they will provide a 5% growth to the world economy for the, for the 15 to 20 years. So it's a very good news. Uh, I've been working in China and India for 20 years. And I've seen how those countries are changing when the free market enters into their country. You know, in China, it, uh, nobody has been 20 years, maybe three, four times per year in China. The com of course, there are big problems, but you know, they are in much better state than now. Now, as far as our company, of course, we have been investing in China, India, uh, and Brazil for 20 years. So uh, all these uh, countries are now part of our company. And, uh, for an international company, it's a very smooth progress. We learn a lot from them. We learn a lot from the Indian, we learn a lot from the Chinese, we probably teach them. And uh, to, to me, all, all is good, all is good. Of course, I know that in China there are problems, uh, but you know, uh, there are less, le, le, there were less problems now than 20 years ago. And you, you have to take a long time, long time horizon, you know. The, usually we want things to move in five years. It takes 500 years to change something. 
you know, or maybe at least 50 years. So we have to be patient. But to me, the move is very positive, of course. Andre? It has been said today. Uh, now, you have to get I mean, closer to the mic. Is it okay? Like I okay. Uh, sustainability is not only financial or economical sustainability. Sustainability is is between social, environmental, and economics. And of course, economics is the engine of, of all that. So when you say five percent or something like that growth in the next decade or something like that is good news. Yes, in the terms of economic sustainability, perhaps. But if you if you look at the global picture, if you think about the energy needs of China or India, uh, if that is good news, it's, well, uh, I have not the answer. No? But of course, this growth is, is legitimate, that's clear. What I could add, maybe, I've been involved in Asia for the last 25 years. Uh, first trip in China was in 88. Um, and indeed, we've seen over the last 20, 25 years in those countries the emergence of a very wild capitalism, let's face it and a high level of consumerism. But we also see today leadership in China, India, and other countries asking themselves the question of sense. Where do we go? And they are challenging us about that point. So I think it's also an opportunity because they fully realize that they cannot just run as they're running today and that men, whether they're Chinese, French, Swiss, or whatever, remains men. And eventually they have to find a sense of purpose. Those people will help the world to find a sense of purpose. So um, as uh, Western people, we were very comfortable for the last century to live within a war where two thirds of humanity was kind of excluded of this uh, open market. Now they are in the open market and I think it's a fantastic chance. Yeah. First here and then we'll come with uh, Indre Ratsu from uh, Romania. Uh, a question for Xavier Fontani. Um, thank you for um, emphasizing what it's like in a controlled economy. And I wonder if you could perhaps um, answer with a piece of advice to somebody striving to model um, servant leadership within a controlled economy, where, as you know and have emphasized, the authoritarian structures are all mostly in place, even though we have a, a free market economy. Thank you. This is a tough, you know, I have no experience of uh, managing in control uh, economy. Uh, I think there are fair people uh, working in control economy. But, you know, um, it's for me very difficult to, to answer your point. I think it's easier uh, to be servant manager in a, in a free market economy because I have no experience of control economy. What I can tell you is that we have been buying uh, com big company in, uh, in East Germany. It was in control economy. People were, people were destroyed. Uh, after uh, 50 years of control economy, they were unable to make decisions. They were unable to make choices. When we, are, we were asking questions, they didn't answer because they were afraid by the police. We had to, to, we had to visit them in the weekend in their house to know uh, why a, ma a machine was broken. So I can tell you that the, uh, the, the, the people were totally destroyed. So of course, I understand in a free market economy, people are stressed. Because if a customer doesn't buy an electric uh, battery, uh, you have to close the factory. But I prefer the stress, uh, which is, uh, and, and thank you to help people to manage the stress, than what I've been think, seeing myself with my eyes in a control economy. So I don't understand what were the bosses in the company where we purchased. They were policemen. They were no bosses. So, uh, so that's, that's the, only, the only answer I can give. Perhaps on that specific point, I don't think it's, it's very useful to, to put against uh, free markets and, and, and public or regulated economies. I mean, you need servant leaders in both worlds, definitely. And the quality that you mentioned about servant leaders are, are valid in both worlds. And just to oppose them and say this, uh, in that type of economy we are more stressed or not more stressed, this uh, is not very useful, I think. Good. Gabriela Müller Mendoza. So this question goes starting with George and then the rest of the panel. Um, given the fact that at least 50% of the world is female and male, right? Maybe if not more. <laughs> um, and out of the 500 Fortune companies, only 12 are run by women. So within the the frame of globalizing, uh, humanizing globalization, 
from your own perspective, two questions. Why is that? And what can be done in both genders? Thank you. I, uh, uh, I, I want to be a little bit provocative on that. I don't think this is uh, a, a, a real problem. I mean, there is an evolution. And it is true that today you find less women in the board and executive part in the Western world than you find men. It's also a question of evolution. When I graduated from my school, there was two ladies uh, among 600 students. Today, the same school, 60% of the students are ladies. My generation today is running companies. Then their generation will see as many women as men. It's a question of timing. Uh, I keep hearing in France, for example, that there is, I think, 24, 25% difference in salary between men and women. This is wrong, totally wrong, because it's a bad usage of statistics. I've checked it in my company and in companies from Les ODC, which is an INAPAC uh, organization in France, so out of 2,000 companies. There is no difference from the same job, same age, same responsibility. There is no difference. The problem is, it, it's a question that today, women are rising through the organization. So if you compare the salary mass divided by number of people between the two groups, indeed, you find a difference. But that doesn't mean we treat women differently from men. You will see women raising, and this is actually the case. Every year you see more women in boards, every year you see more women being CEOs. In our organization, we start having women running factories, which when I started my career was impossible. So it's a question of sort of timing coming in. And in a new country, you see a lot of women running companies and developing. So I would say it's not a false problem, it's a reality, but it's a reality that's changing very rapidly and for the good one. I mean, I, I fully agree with that. I, t I t totally agree, nothing to add. I totally agree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, Martin Wilde from Uniapak Europe. Uh, I want to highlight this issue of subsidiarity. And in my point of view, that is really a key to humanizing our economic world because this allows to put face-to-face -face relationships again at the center of our uh, interactions. And if you do a relecture of Adam Smith, you will remember that besides his Wealth of Nation, he wrote the theory of moral sentiments where he describes the, let me put it, social laws of the small community uh, the family, the neighborhood, and so on and so forth. And I think if we really want to humanize globalization, we have to look at the small units where the face-to-face -face relationship uh, is key. And I think that is only possible if we really obey the principle of subsidiarity, even in our businesses. And, and I think that is, if I look at the, at the Christian social teachings, with the principle of the common good, the principle of personality, solidarity, and subsidiarity. This is the precise recipe to interlink these two worlds, the big world of anonymous relations, the wealth of nation, and the small world of face-to-face -face relationships of the theory of moral sentiments. And I think we have to highlight this, otherwise I will be afraid we will discuss the wrong issues. Do you I mean, you want to uh, that's why I pick up the point of subsidiarity very rapidly. Think about this pilot in the boat, knowing this captain in this cabin. He takes the whole responsibility, but he's standing up. His dignity is fully respected. For the boss, he's no visible, and that's where he's a real servant. And you can really build a company around that. Yes. <clears throat> My answer to your point is just a comment, is that the way we... Uh, favor subsidiarity is in the organigrams of the company, in the chart of the company. At Essila, we try a boss should be able to, to work with 12 to 15 people. So the big issue is to get very flat organization. Because in Essila, uh, between the chairman of the company and the, the, and the employee in the factory, there are only five steps. So when you have only five steps, uh, it kills, first of, first of all, bureaucracy. And bureaucracy is a killer to subsidiarity, so you have to take, and bureaucracy exists everywhere, even in large companies, and the way to do it is to get very flat organigram. Now it's very difficult, it's very demanding, but this is the way to go. So that's the way we promote uh, subsidiarity, very, very flat. So everybody has to grow, uh, everybody is responsible of something. So uh, subsidiarity needs a very good architect of organization, and basically you kill bureaucracy as much as you can. Yeah. That, I'm sorry for the other questions that you have. You can catch the panelists later. I think the one interesting insight here among the many 
is that we do come back to people, face to face, individuals. There are human beings with emotions, families, lives, purposes. How does a CEO running a large organization be able to take that into account and still be socially responsible and make a profit? How about joining me in a very nice round of applause for our panelists? Thank you very much.